We have this morning our mission partner and friend and member and elder on our session, Han, Reverend Hannah Massad. Um, Hannah is from Gaza. He's a Baptist minister, and he has a ministry that he serves in Gaza, Christians and also refugees in Jordan from Iraq and Syria. We are very grateful to have him bring us the word this morning. Will you pray for him with me? Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for Hannah, for how you use him, for the way that your word is alive in our lives. We ask that you would use these words to become more alive in us today. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, before I'm reading Psalm 23, just want to encourage you, um, God really helped us with our small little mission. Uh, to give Christmas gifts to almost 2,300 boys and girls in Gaza, in the Christian community, in West Bank, and also among the refugees in Jordan. So that was really um, a blessing to see that, and grateful for that. Um, Psalm uh, 23, and I thought it's proper in the beginning of this year um, to meditate and to think um, on Psalm 23. Um, let us read. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name, name's sake. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray just as the Lord to bless his word to us. Lord, we thank you for your precious word this morning. We just pray to open our hearts and our minds and give us freedom as we hear and as we share. Cover our weakness, Lord Jesus, we pray under your precious blood, and we give you all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Psalm of David, Psalm 23, it's well known, and it's not only the most popular psalm and, you know, among the 150, but these six verses probably the most popular verses in the whole Old Testament. And I should say, these six verses is one of the most popular verses in the whole Bible. And uh, we see David, who wrote this psalm probably later in his life as he reflect the goodness of God and how the Lord was with him in his journey of life and journey of faith. You know, he has some challenges in his life, mistreated by his father and also by his seven siblings and also by his mentor. In young age, probably age 15 or 14, he was anointed by Samuel the prophet to be king over Israel, but took him another 50, sorry, 15 more years before he's sitting on the throne of Judah and he governed not only Judah but all Israel for 40 years. The psalm is a blessing for so many people. My aunt in her death bid repeated this song. It says Lincoln in his time of depression, he study repeated, read this psalm a lot. President Bush, in one of the most difficult times in this great nation, in September 11, he read Psalm 23 to calm a nation which hurt terribly. This psalm talks about the intimate relationship that every one of us can have with the Good Shepherd. 
In Ezekiel, he used the metaphorical language to describe Jehovah God, Yahweh, that he is the shepherd who gather and take care of his people. And the popular verse in Isaiah 40, verse 11, says about the Lord, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads though those that have young. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus' loved one not only as the good shepherd, but we see him as the chief shepherd in First Peter chapter 5. And in Hebrew chapter 13, we see Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. The word sheep mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible, but the popular verse in Isaiah 53, 6, where he said, we all like sheep, have gone astray. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, it talks about when we came back to the Lord through salvation and redemption. He said in 1 Peter 2, 25, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. And Revelation chapter 7 tells us the Lord Jesus as a shepherd will continue even to lead us as a shepherd even in the eternity as we see in Revelation chapter 7, verse 17. But we see, loved one, intimate relationship between the good shepherd and the sheep, that he knows every single one of us by his name. And the sheep knows and able to discern and to distinguish the voice of the good shepherd. And he loves his sheep so much to the point he's willing to lay his life for every single one of them. You know, when they built the sheep pen, they built it without a door. And when you ask the shepherd, where is the door? And he will say, I am the door. Because literally at night, he lay down, he put his body to close that gate to protect the sheep from the wild animal as if he said, on my dead body. He has the authority to lay his life, and he has the authority also to take it. But he chose to lay his life for every single one of us. This is how much he loves us. In verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I like to wait here for a moment when we say, the Lord is my shepherd. Because the image of God, loved one, the, the image or the images of God has been distorted in our mind and our thinking because of the culture and sometimes because of bad teaching. And the Lord wants us all to see him as he revealed himself through the scripture that indeed he is a good shepherd and full of goodness, full of love, mercy, compassion, and passion and forgiveness. And when we accept him, he took our condemnation. He took our shame. He took our guilt. And there is no need to continue to carry this the rest of our life because it's been covered, it's been forgiven under the precious blood of Jesus. And he gave us the liberty to live for him. The Lord is my shepherd. We know God didn't need anything outside of himself but he created us because he loves us so much. Somebody say when his love overflow, when his love explode, he created so we will know him, enjoy him, and to have this intimate relationship with him. He revealed himself to us in many different ways. He revealed himself to us through our conscience and through his written word and through the creation. But the ultimate revelation, he revealed himself through a person of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how much he wants us to know him. And no one can stop him. This is why he wants very much as a relational God to have this relationship with him. This is why love one Christianity it's not just words we repeat. It's not even doctrine we believe, even though that's very important. But simply Christianity, 
Christ lives in me and I live in him. Father, as he prayed in John 17, as you are in me and I in you, may they be one in us. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing, which mean all my needs, physical needs, spiritual, emotional, relational, whatever needs that you need will be met through him. Augustine of Hippo says something like this, our souls are from you and our souls will be restless until it rests in you. We as a human being, loved one, we tried a lot of things, stuff of this world, to bring happiness and meaning and purpose. And we discover nothing unless we go back to the source, to the one who breathed life in me and you and who created you and me in his image. And even when we rebel against, he didn't leave us, but paid the ultimate price. Not silver or gold, but his precious blood for every one of us. I just read one verse which say how the Lord meets our needs. Psalm 37, 25. I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging a bread. And also you can read later Psalm 34, 10, Philippians 4:19. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. He makes, in verse 2, he makes me lay down in a green butchers. I should say there's not many or much green butchers in Palestine because of not much rain. We get some rain in the winter time but the rest of the year, there's not much. But with the little rain and the mature and the wind, especially in the evening, especially in that area in Bethlehem where David used to take the, his sheep in the wilderness, you know, the good shepherd will flip these stones, these rook stones on the mountains. And usually what's happened with the little rain and the moisture of the wind, there will be little small planet under these stones or beside these stones, he, he has to flip it to help the sheep because the sheep, as you know, 100% they depend on their shepherd. So there will be little bite here, little bite there. But for the sheep to lay down, there is need at least four things to be available. And I think Philip Keller mentioned it in his book when he talked about Psalm 23. First of all, the, the sheep have to be fearful. If the sheep are afraid, they will not be able to lay down in peace. And second, if there is a worm in their body, also they cannot. And this is remind us, if there is a sin in my life, I have to confess it and receive the forgiveness of the Lord and move on. Also, if there is a friction between one sheep or another in the same flock, they will not be in peace. But also, if there is no full belly, if they're hungry, they will not be able to to lay down in peace. For you and me, loved one, to experience this peace which is so precious, especially, especially in these days, we need to feed our mind with the Word of God. This is treasure in the Word of God. It's written for our benefit. We need to feed our mind with the truth of the Word of God. And second, we need to free our mind. We need to free our mind from the lies of the enemies. Because there is some time in your life and my life, we believed certain lies the enemy planted in our minds. And the scriptures say we need to take capture these lies which is invaded in our minds and liberate ourselves by the grace of God and make these lies in submission to or for obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ. And third, we need to focus on the Lord, which help us to arrange our priorities. I think Rick Warren, he mentioned these words, all of them start with the word F, 
Feed your mind with the word of God. Free your mind from the lies of the enemy and focus on the Lord. He makes me lay down in a green bush. And then in verse 3, he says, he restores my soul. You know, the soul consists of the will, the thinking, the mind, the emotions. But my soul and your soul can take us wandering and is scattered, and we shouldn't trust self. We shouldn't trust our soul. And there's two examples in the psalm, Psalm 131. You can look at it later, but uh, verse 2. But the one I want to look quickly in Psalm 42, there's a thought came to David, a thought of sadness and of grief and maybe even depression. And one of the things we need to learn, don't allow your soul talk to you, but you talk to your soul because you have the authority, because your mind is renewed by the word of God and you have the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit because your mind is shaped through the word of God. So you speak to your soul. This is why he comes in Psalm 42 and he said these words. Why are you downcast? Your hope, he said to his soul, your hope in the Lord. As if he said, self, sit down. Let me tell you something. Let, tell me, let me tell you about who my God is and who I am as the child of God. And then he said, my hope in the Lord. And in verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, there is a real valley in Palestine, Israel, called the valley of death. If you come from Jerusalem going down to Jericho, there is a lot of curves, and the thieves hide behind these curves to attack people who are traveling that road at that time. And he said, if I walk in that danger road, I fear not because you are with me. The valley shadow of death could be sickness, could be challenges, a trial. The Lord knows what you going through. But also I want to look, loved one, at the valley of the shadow of death. It's remind me quickly about a young pastor who just buried his young wife. And he was returning home by himself with his little two children, aged probably 10 and 12. And he struggled a little bit how to, to tell the girls what's happened to their mother. And while he was driving in the freeway, there is a huge truck past them very quickly. And the shadow of that truck covered the car. And he looked at the girls and said, do you want to face that huge truck or do you prefer to face the shadow? And the little girl, 10, 12 years old, thought that's a silly question. Of course, the shadow. And he said, Jesus, because he faced death, we, his follower, facing the shadow of death. Because he overcame, we will overcome with him. And our last breath here will be the first breath for us in the presence of the Lord. And this is what mother faced. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and the staff comfort me. You know... The sheep who depend completely on the shepherd, every time they see the staff and every time they see the rod, they feel peace. Because they know the shepherd will use this rod to protect them against the wild animals. And he will use that staff, you know, which have hook like on the top, where he can bring the little baby lamb if they need special attention. Though that will bring comfort. Even though I know the 
rod sometimes for my discipline, but because he's a loving father, that will be okay because he wants the best for me. Your rod and the staff comfort me. And then he says in verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And this is a beautiful picture, especially in that land in the Middle East. The host, the host will take care of the guests. If you come, the host will greet you, will give you a kiss here, kiss here, and back here. And then he will wash your feet, and then he will put some oil that, and give you something to drink to refresh. But also the host will prepare a table before you. And this is what he said. He didn't say he prepared a table in the absence of my enemy, no. He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, it's remind me of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Last Supper. Can you imagine that? That he's with his disciple, preparing that table for them. And the people outside, the religious leaders, want, are planning to kill him. But here he is, preparing a table before his children. And this reminds us, even at that moment, he gave the honor seat for Judas sitting on his left side. And even he himself fed him to show how much he continued to love him. But unfortunately, Judas chose another road. But also, not only the last supper, but also the last breakfast, if you will, when he revealed himself in the Sea of Galilee. And we know all the disciples turned their back on Jesus, except John. But here he is preparing a table for them. And he allowed them to use some of the fish they have so they feel as partner. But he himself was feeding and taking care of his disciples. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know why? Because we become also the people of the covenant. And the Lord in this covenant saying to every one of his children, everything I have is yours and everything you have, it's mine. Now you are steward of what I trusted in you. And we become people of the covenant under the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 6, the last verse, he says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. The word surely in Hebrew, ad, means absolute assurance, 100% goodness and love. And the word love could translate mercy the Hebrew is hasid, which is covenant faithfulness. And the Lord said, all your life, this is for guarantee, as a child of God, there is goodness and love will follow you. And the word, <clears throat> when he say, follow me, also come from radifani, the Hebrew word. It came from the verb radifa, which beautiful, which means not only these Goodness and love follow me. It means to run after me at, and attach to me or accompany me. It's become part of who you are. I will it will in the house of the Lord forever. And I want to say we dwell in the house of the Lord not only when we come to the church, but because he lives in me. As we say the Christianity in simple words, Christ lives in me and I live in him. Because he lives in me, I'm in the presence, I'm in the house of the Lord continuously at 24-7. And the last thing I just want to say, what a godly man said, 
I desire three things in this world. First, I want beauty. Second, I want peace. Third, I want to have some influence in the kingdom of God. When he talks about the beauty, a beauty from inside out, as we continue, loved one, be transformed by the word of God, as we continue to change, this beauty will reveal more and more from inside to outside. And then peace, which the Lord made for us all. And lastly, Lord, help me to have some influence, even if it's a little, in your kingdom to expand your kingdom. How much we thank the Lord, for he is indeed our good shepherd. Let us just pray and say, Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, intimate relationship. Thank you that you opened the eyes of my heart to see you, to know you, and to live the rest of my life for you. I thank you that I'm not alone and I will never be alone. You are with me all the stages of my life, even if I walk in that valley shadow of death, because you are with me in this journey. That's bring joy and peace to my life and give you all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name, amen.